Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Taking ESG Mainstream webinar. This is a first uh, in a series of Reuters events webinars on ESG, all leading up to our annual summit in the 27th and the 28th of May here in London, um, which will be all about taking ESG mainstream and will feature leaders in ESG from major asset managers and the investment community as a whole. Um, today, we've got a great panel discussion for you um, where we'll be talking about some of the key trends and topics which are to be tackled with regards to ESG in 2020. Um, our fantastic panelists will be taking you through what their ambitions are this year um, and beyond and what key steps they really need to be taking both within their own shops and then also as an industry in order to really progress and to mainstream ESG as a key tool for um, investment decision making. So today we have Veronica Chow, who is a partner and director Sustainable Investment and Social Impact at Boston Consulting Group. Veronica will be chairing the sessions today. Um, we also have Andrew Parry, who's Head of Sustainable Investment at Newton Investment Management. Frank Sieblitz, who's the Senior Director um, and Head of ESG at DIFF Capital Partners. And we have Pedro Fernandez Diaz, who's a Director um, at Responsibility Investments. So, Veronica, if you'd like to take over and you can start the, um, with a short presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. And hello to everyone on the line. Really delighted to be with all of you today. As Dominic mentioned, my name is Veronica Chow. I'm a partner with the Boston Consulting Group where I focus on sustainable finance and investing, working with asset managers, private equity firms, institutional investors, and other financial institutions on advancing their strategies and capabilities in sustainable investing. And on today's panel, uh, what we'd like to discuss is what is at the top of the agenda for 2020 in ESG. I think for those of us who are active in the space, this really does feel like a watershed moment. And so we're looking forward to spending this hour in a very lively and engaging discussion to hear from some of the top investors in the space who are on this panel with me about what are their plans to really make the most of this unique moment in time. As we go through the presentation, we would welcome your comments and questions. Uh, so let's make this super interactive. The flow of the show is I will provide some opening remarks and comments just to set the stage on what are some of the major trends in the space and what do we see as the key drivers. I'll then be asking each of our great panelists both to introduce themselves as well as to share what are some of the big things that they will be working on in 2020. We'll have a lively discussion and then open it up uh, for you all to ask some of your questions as well. So on that note, why don't we kick it off? And if we could just move to the next slide, please. So whenever we start these conversations, we like just to establish some common vocabulary because this space is fraught with a number of different missions and different terms. So this is the terminology that uh, we at BCG have embraced and it's from the Global Sustainable Investing Alliance. Uh, of all the different sorts of things that uh, we refer to when using the term sustainable investing, let's start on the left-hand side with negative screening and normative screens this is where, in many ways, sustainable investing started with some of the early ethical and responsible investments, screening out some of the worst performers of some of the companies that were in violations of different norms and treaties. But I think what's been super interesting is the evolution of both products, but also overall philosophies to investment that start to occur more on the right-hand side of this page. So ESG integration, which refers to actually intentionally incorporating E or S or governance factors into investment decision makings, either within a dedicated badged sustainable investment product or just as good investment approach. The next category, best in class or ESG overlays, refers to the actual construction of investment products that would be um, tilted towards those types of companies or assets that have higher ESG performance. 
the thematic funds, that's where we refer to the put, construction of funds or portfolios that use certain sustainability themes as a high conviction towards um, out creating some kind of alpha or, or positive impact. Impact investing refers to those sorts of products where not only are, is there an ESG theme, but there is also an intentional pursuit of a sustainability objective alongside a financial objective, as well as a rigorous measurement of the, that non-financial performance. And finally, active ownership and engagement, and that's where we're seeing more and more investors using their position as owners of an asset, as a shareholder or as a creditor to really support and engage companies or assets to, to make positive changes in how they're doing business in order to create a more sustainable business model and ultimately, ultimately a more sustainable economy. So these are all the sorts of things uh, that fall under the you know, umbrella term sustainable investing. And most investors use a variety of these types of approaches across individual products or indeed across their entire shop. So that's hopefully that was helpful just to frame what are we talking about today. If we go to the next slide, what we see in the market is that the uh, the share of assets that are in, in managed using one or more of these types of sustainable investing approaches are actually growing at a faster rate than the overall uh, asset management space. And to us, this is a very encouraging trend for two reasons. One is, you know, it shows that this whole notion of sustainable investing is really entering the mainstream. And the other uh, part that is super interesting is when uh, we look at not just this information from an assets under management perspective, but if we look at where are the revenues uh, in the asset management space, we actually find that uh, this picture is even more pronounced where um, because many of the sustainably invested assets tend to be more active than passive, they're also correlated with a much higher share of revenues for investors. So it, I think investors are increasingly recognizing that both from an asset gathering perspective, but also from a uh, pricing perspective, building up these capabilities and being able to position themselves as leaders in the sustainable investing space will become increasingly imperative for their overall business in 2020 and beyond. <clears throat> if we can move to the next slide. When we think about what's driving this growth, we see four key factors as what's behind it. The first is that these different factors, environmental, social and governance trends, are becoming increasingly financial material. And I think you know, for, for many folks, the governance and ensuring that companies are well run and well governed has always been table stakes. But what's been interesting to see over the past several years is how much more financially material both environmental performance of companies as well as their social performance. At BCG, our value sciences team has actually run some analysis uh, where we were exploring the relationship between a company's environmental performance or their performance on social dimensions with a company's valuation multiples. And we were actually quite surprised by how strong of correlation uh, that we have found. We found that in certain sectors such as oil and gas, there are companies that enjoy as high as a 20% valuation premium uh, compared to those that are underperforming on either environmental or social factors. When we looked at pharmaceuticals and consumer goods, we also found valuation premiums north of 10%. So there's a, you know, we're seeing a, a strong correlation as well there. And this type of analysis has been repeated by Merrill Lynch, by BlackRock, by Bank of America. And there's just an increasing evidence base now that companies that manage towards higher environmental, social, and governance performance in the long run uh, you know, do pay off for investors. The other key trend that we see driving growth in this space is the growing concern about the more systematic risks um, in that both environmental and social trends are, are facing. And here it's obviously climate that is the most pronounced and defining issue for 2020. And we see investors across the board are really beginning to recognize the full magnitude of what climate change will mean for their portfolios. Uh, for example, a recent study came out from the UNPRI uh, towards the end of last year that, based on different scenarios, found that 
anywhere between 1.6 to 2.3 trillion dollars of value could be repriced in equity markets due to a mix of the regulatory and physical impacts of climate change alone. And as a result, we're seeing investors really now wake up and say, okay, what are we going to do both in terms of our asset allocation, but also how we're stewarding those assets in light of these, in light of these uh, risks. The third trend that we see is growing pressure from end clients. And here we see both uh, on the retail side, we're seeing um, the beginnings of, of strong interest from retail clients, dominated in particular by women and millennials. But we're also seeing this play out by the end clients of pension plans and other sorts of institutional investors where they themselves are feeling pressure in, to have a, you know, take a strong stance on some of these issues. And uh, for example, uh, UBS just recently released a study that found that across the retail investor base, 65% of retail investors believed it's important to create a better planet, but only 39% had actually found suitable investment products to do so. So there is this this growing um, interest of, among clients now for these types of solutions. And then finally, in particular for the audience on this call, uh, for those of you in Europe and the UK, um, regulation is a strong driver. Two examples, the UK Stewardship Code, uh, which has recently come into effect, it sets a much higher bar on the types of activities and outcomes for ESG engagement. And then there's also, uh, it is also expected in the UK that in late 2020, um, under MIFID II, there'll be some requirement for IFAs to be asking customers about their ESG preferences alongside uh, their financial preferences. And so it's all this whole mix of materiality, systematic risk, consumer interest, as well as regulatory that's just creating this true watershed moment. You can just move to the next slide. So the title of this webinar was, you know, what are some of the key to unlocking then, you know, financial materiality and really moving ESG and sustainable investing into the mainstream. So here are three trends that we see uh, investors really focusing on into 2020 and beyond. And then I'd love to open it up to our panel to hear, you know, if these are the same types of trends and with what is on their agenda for 2020, but three, three, key, three key trends that we are currently observing. First is that investors need to get out front of both the growing variety and the increasing velocity of the financial materiality of these ESG factors. And as we look to 2020, a key trend that we anticipate is that investors will need to both get out in front of some of these environmental trends, particularly climate, but they're also going to have to deepen their expertise on a much broader range of both E and S topics, particularly on the social side. And uh, for example, in, in a recent survey that we've seen, 46% um, of investors believe that social issues will have a strong impact on share prices by 2022. And so this is creating a, a key imperative that we see in particular for research teams and ESG teams to build out capabilities and understanding a whole new breadth of topics as well as looking carefully at the types of data and research and analytical sources that they are subscribing from. A second key theme is the shift from a risk mindset to one of value creation. And we believe that to really lead in this space, investors will have to evolve their approach from that risk management approach to one where ESG is seen as a true source of value creation. And what we see as driving this is, we. There, the whole space of corporate disclosures we anticipate will become much more consistent. Um, as recently as uh, last week in Davos, the International Business Coalition released a proposed set of common uh, corporate disclosure metrics that we believe will just drive somewhat more of a commodification, if you will, of just key ESG data. This, in many ways, will lead to investors needing to take a much more sophisticated approach then to how are they using ESG as a source for true alpha generation and not just simply screening out risks. The third key trend we see is that um, many of these environmental and social issues are manifesting themselves at a truly system level way 
and issues such as climate change or global inequality or biodiversity loss. These are creating systematic risks, which traditional ways of de-risking a portfolio, i.e. reducing exposure, just won't work anymore. And so in 2020, we see um, a strong imperative for investors to really build up their approach to investment stewardship and engagement because there are just certain risks now in the economy that simply tilting a fund away from will not be able to compensate for. So these are some of the key trends that we see as being top of mind uh, in 2020, but I'd love to hear from our other panelists. Why don't we start with um, Andrew, Andrew Perry. Maybe if you could introduce yourself, uh, your firm, and then also talk about what's the top of your agenda for 2020. Right. Many thanks, and that's a very helpful introduction. So I'm Andrew Parry, Head of Sustainable Investing at Newton Investment Management. We're a $62 billion investment management firm, um, a part of the BMY Mellon Group with around about $1.8 trillion of assets in total. Uh, the we, Our product range is across public equities, both ESG integrated, sustainable and thematic, uh, multi assets and credit. And ESG is integrated across all elements of what we do. Um, so it, it, we've been voting since our formation in 1979. We've been engaging uh, uh, since for 20 years. And we've had a responsible investing team since 2004. So it's very much ESG as a sort of integrated part of the investment process is very well established. Um, I've been in the investment industry now for 35 years, and I often joke this is the first time in my entire life that I've become fashionable, um, which is a reflection of the rising interest in ESG and sustainability. I think it is definitely a time of transition. I think we are at a point where not only is the discussion about sustainability and ESG and indeed impact and the SDGs becoming almost ubiquitous. It's also about maybe a changing mindset in actually how we deploy it, how we implement it within portfolios. But actually, and I think even maybe this is even more important, how this has been reflected, not just in society, but in corporate boardrooms. And I think for this to be real, this is what we have to have. It's not just about limited actors uh, on the stage uh, calling for change. It's about this much more integrated at the societal level. Think about incentives and how do we incentivize change. I think that's a really important part. And in many ways, I see 2020 as going beyond ESG. You know, for many years, if you're an early adopter of ESG, you spent a lot of time justifying why. I always think that was the wrong question. I think you turn it around and say, why the heck wouldn't you think about environmental, social and governance inputs into the evaluation of an investment opportunity? Doesn't matter whether you're fixed income, public equity, private market. Without considering the material and salient environmental, social and governance factors, I repeat the words because it's important to remind people what ESG stands for. If you don't think about them, then and in the context of the company and the industry, then you don't have a complete picture. You know, do you want to, in the end, invest in companies that are inefficient in their use of environmental inputs, energy, uh, water, non-renewable commodities, or, or profligate in waste, or don't try to reduce their consumption of raw materials? Because they end up with lower or more volatile margins. On the social side, do you want companies with high staff turnover, absenteeism, strike rates? because that's lower productivity, but also there's a new social dimension and it's to people's top line. You know, companies uh, in America in the dairy industry are going bust because consumer preferences are moving from animal-based proteins to plant-based proteins. You know, so demand patterns are reflecting social norms shifting and changing. So I'm thinking about that top line and future franchise value and then once you get to governance, do we really want to own the badly managed companies because they are serial destroyers of shareholder value? So very much for me, I think this is transition from seeing ESG as a label to really just seeing it as finance 101. It should be integrated into all our considerations across all investment classes. Now, 
That means it has to be material and salient to the issues within that company. And it has to be linked to the appropriate time horizon. Um, but it is just good finance. So I think we're moving beyond that. Um, I think increasingly we are going to have spent a lot of work in the industry thinking about how we value values. Um, you know, so how do we how do we place a valuation on on, on ESG inputs? Uh, because if you go beyond a mere label, because a label or a ranking is price independent, uh, prices of securities move around a lot, and and that is. Uh, as Veronica, Veronica just met, mentioned, that it is also, you know, we're seeing companies trade at premiums. Now we have to make sure those premiums are justified for good behaviors. But there does seem to be a lot of evidence, not through much market factor approaches, but through what corporate behavior and co way companies manage themselves, that taking a truly sustainable and integrated approach to managing ESG risks in your business actually gives you more secure, more resilient, higher corporate rates of return on capital employed. And that's both human capital and financial and physical capital. So I think very much the, the change that we're all going to begin to think about is very much thinking about sustainability from the corporate perspective. What are companies doing? How are they allocating capital? How do they manage those uh, systemic risks? How do they avoid becoming a stranded business model? How do they integrate that into their thinking and their supply chain and their management of their human resources? Because remember, at the end of the day, every company is a social enterprise. You know, we at BMY Mellon employ, I think, 65,000 people, which is the same size uh, of, uh, as my hometown in South Wales. You know, the top 500 companies globally employ 68 million people, the size of the population of the United Kingdom. Uh, they control 70% of global trade and they have over $30 trillion of uh, revenue. De facto, they have a significant influence on societal outcomes. And I think this is why we're beginning to see another hot topic, the rise of the notion of corporate purpose. Jamie Dimon's yeah. business round table letter, which BMY Mellon were a signatory to, Larry Fink's letters, etc. That I think companies are now beginning to focus much more on their purpose, moving away from the primacy of shareholders and realizing the multi stakeholder approach is not a cynical marketing exercise. But if they want to be relevant for the long term, that is maybe the new zeitgeist. This is the new the shift in the same way that 1970 was the rise of neoliberalism and a different corporate model, maybe, just maybe we are at a point where we are beginning to see a shift. So I think that's very important. And then one final point, I think we are going to see a shift in the notion of engagement. Mm -hmm. I think often that's just been framed in the power of voting. I think it goes well beyond uh, uh, voting. It's about being an active, engaged ownership owners. So for us, it's about actually the dialogue that we have with management, making sure our dialogue on environmental, social and governance inputs and their associated risks is integrated into all meetings. Every meeting with a company is an opportunity to engage on those material issues, to provide a feedback loop to us to be better informed in our investment decisions, but ultimately better informed as well on any voting intentions. Which, um, uh, but also a feedback loop to the management of what we think are the most important issues that need addressing and managing, not telling companies how to run themselves, but raising awareness. But increasingly, we are getting our clients, pension funds, insurance companies, private wealth and charities, asking us to reflect their values to the clients that we own, uh, to the companies that we own on their behalf. And I think that's a big sea change. And this is again reflecting the potential societal change where people want us to be actually engaging not on the things that we just what we think is important, but the values that they think are important. And then the one final uh, challenge that we all have as an industry is better reporting. And I agree that has to come from better reporting at the corporate level and ideally a standardization rather than the standardization of the labels put on funds first because we don't have standardization of the output from the people really doing it, i.e. the companies, 
then we're in danger of not really giving a complete picture. So those are my, yeah, my ambitious imperatives for this year. Terrific, Andrew, thank you. What, what a great uh, way to open it up. Frank, you, you want to talk about what uh, you see at DIF, and I think it's quite complementary given some of the more specific asset classes where you're focused. Yeah, thank you, uh, Veronica. My name is uh, Frank Siebles. I'm responsible for ESG with uh, DIF Capital Partners. Uh, DIF Capital Partners is a leading infrastructure investment manager uh, across the globe, but based in Schiphol, uh, Amsterdam. We have raised over uh, 6 billion and are managing eight funds with 135 people around the globe. Um, for us, uh, when we uh, picked up ESG a few years ago as a uh, specific strategic objective, it was about defining what does it mean for infrastructure. And thinking about it, we came to the conclusion, at, uh, the explicit conclusion that infrastructure is about providing services to consumers to society and the the very let's say, nature of the infrastructure assets that we invest in, they typically last for 30, 50 or even 100 years. Uh, so there's an uh, implicit and embedded way that sustainability is important to those assets. We're not investing for a two, three year window, make a profit and go away. You know, we run funds that last 10, 15 years and we are responsible for those assets invested in the in the funds. Um, so there was a, a very natural fit with uh, sound ESG management and uh, long-term asset performance and therefore fund performance. Uh, I think one thing I noticed is that over the last couple of years, uh, the environmental part within the infrastructure space was relatively limited. Um, yes, there was a focus on sourcing renewable energy, uh, but uh, what I've noticed over the last 6 to 12 months is that climate change is by far the number one topic on the agenda of all investors. Uh, and yes, they I think uh, the, the SMG, uh, the safety, social governance, that's all uh, important as well. Uh, we're currently fundraising two funds, uh, and I noticed that when I have meeting with investors, especially from Europe, a little bit less from Asia and, and uh, the US, uh, ESG has, uh, and, and climate change in particular, has came up from being let's say, number three or number five priority on their list to uh, number one for certain uh, investors. So climate change is uh, uh, translated into certain questions. For example, an investor saying, how are you going to make sure that uh, next time we sit together, you can offer us a net zero portfolio? Uh, and that translates then into how can you a measure uh, emissions from a road project or a social infra project and it's not an easy question in a very diversified portfolio but it's a valid one and i think that's one of the key challenges that we have at this is to be able to explain to our investors what the footprint of our assets is and what are the opportunities to uh, to bring it down in the, uh, the context of, uh, of climate change and global warming I think our response uh, for that is in uh, 2020, we are looking uh, to two ways to our portfolio, making a climate change heat map that looks at the one hand at uh, let's say the physical effects of climate change on our existing asset base. We have a number of assets in Australia, for example. Uh, luckily, they are not physically affected yet by the, uh, the bushfires. But you can imagine that if you're building a solar park or a wind farm, which by nature are uh, renewable, so contributing to a, a, a lower carbon economy. But the supply chain for those uh, construction uh, projects comes from or goes through areas affected by bushfire. So even if you're investing in a, uh, a sustainable project, you can be affected by the, uh, the current effects of, of climate change. The second uh, topic in that context is the more transitional elements. Uh, so if you're currently investing in, for example, a gas network in Germany uh, or other uh, tank storage uh, or assets uh, around the globe, they are increasingly being affected by uh, transitional effects. And that can be policy, but also public perception. Uh, and uh, I think some of the other speakers already mentioned it. Uh, we have a responsibility to make sure our investors or our funds uh, don't have, end up with stranded assets 
So the, the challenge for our portfolio investments is to find a way uh, to uh, reinvent themselves, develop themselves, and it's not always easy for an infrastructure asset. If you're a road or a hospital or wind farm, then there's it's not so much flexibility as a corporate to uh, to develop your activities. But for example, we have a, a German gas network, and that is now developing a pilot to build a hydrogen production facility to see if they can contribute to the uh, German energy transition where Germany is uh, phasing out of nuclear and, and coal and therefore at the moment heavily relying on gas uh, but I guess uh, gas increasingly being considered as a uh, polluting fossil fuel uh, to see if we can contribute uh, to uh, moving uh, green gas into the, uh, the energy mix. Uh, so that's the, I think, by far the number one challenge for 2020: climate change and how does infrastructure uh, can contribute to uh, to limiting or even reducing climate change. Uh, the second one, I think, was already mentioned, is uh, reporting transparency in data. Investors uh, are always looking for data, and our findings so far is that ESG, uh, it's it's not so easy to uh, translate all information into hard data. Uh, people like black and white uh, scores, performance, uh, progress, but there is still a, a large challenge uh, and I've read somewhere that it took us 500 years or more to develop the accounting standards and as a ministry we're now supposed to um, develop uh, sustainability standards within a much shorter time frame. So I think that's a collective challenge where we would all benefit uh, because investors are uh, that they be provided with uh, individual company reporting, which is not easy to compare one to another. Um, so that's the, the the number two challenge I see within uh, ESG in the infrastructure space, at least. Um, that was in a nutshell um, my uh, contribution to this uh, webinar. So, Veronica. Terrific. Great. Very consistent uh, overall trends. Pedro, we'd love for you to, to round it out, both offering um, some more context about responsibility as well as what's top of the 2020 agenda for, for you. Yes. Uh, hi, Veronica. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all, all the panelists and thank you for Reuters for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm the head of ESG at Responsibility. Uh, for those who don't know my company, Responsibility is a private asset manager based in Zurich in Switzerland that invests solely and only in developing countries. So we, we don't do infrastructure and, and, and a lot of what we do, it's, it's mostly private debt. We do a little bit of private equity, uh, but it's mostly private debt in only emerging countries. So this is kind of just to frame a little bit um, what I'm going to uh, mention now about our approach uh, to ESG and also about the challenges and the issues that I see. No, I just also for reference, we have roughly 3 billion US dollars of assets under management and we do invest in three areas. No, we do th or themes. No, we do climate related investments, sustainable food and agriculture behind it, but not only agriculture and, and financial inclusion through microfinance institutions and also through um, um, in, in financial intermediaries who provide uh, lending to uh, or capital to SME companies. No, and again, we, we do this only in developing countries. And we also do this only in micro and SME companies. Not that, as, as you know, based on the latest data published by the World Bank Group, it's roughly accounts for 400 500, to 500 million uh, companies, both in the formal and informal sectors. No? And, and most of these companies are in the developing countries where we are present. Uh, so th therefore, they, in terms of our approach to ESG, it's fairly, um, defined by the universe uh, in which we invest. No, because in these micro SME companies that are non-listed, the data uh, it's typically not available. So we cannot rely on on self-reported data or an ESG questionnaire or an, a corporate sustainability report from the company simply because we don't do corporates, we don't do large organizations. No, and also because the the, the ESG performance of, of these investees and the data ESG data in general needs to be challenged in general. Why? Well, because yes, there's there's a you know I think more and more a, a decent uh, regulation around these topics in all the countries where we operate. But the reality is that in terms of enforcement, um, 
the, the maybe the authorities are not doing what typically we see in other parts of the world no and therefore i'm not saying the companies don't perform it's just that we need to make sure that we need to start by just simply making sure that whatever assumptions we are making has to be uh, good enough no and that is again um what defines our approach to ESG. you know my, my role and responsibility is to to make sure that um, that the esg due diligence process that we put in place throughout all the investments is done according to our criteria because again we cannot simply rely on self-reported data no? and this is an issue, an issue that i will touch on later on no? um, so we therefore have to strike data on the ground directly from, from each of the companies during our due diligence process no and and again we, we don't do equity that much we mostly do private debt which is also an issue no? so let's say our approach is somehow similar to what you will see in equity, but we apply it in, in private debt, no? which is, I think, the, 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 the interesting part. No? And so the, the, the problem that we have, and you might be thinking, okay, but yeah, but you cannot, because it's debt, you, might, you don't have the ability to extract a lot of data. Yes, and our ability to extract extensive data points is limited, but on the other hand, the data that we extract is, we can say it's reliable because it comes directly from us. You know? So, <clears throat> and, and, and this is kind of, um, a little bit in a nutshell, our approach to ESG. You know, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, I believe I have mentioned that, uh, we do responsibility does only impact the investing, uh, going back to the diagram and the slide that uh, Veronica showed. But it's also worth mentioning that by doing impact investing, we don't exclude the other uh, categories that are all, were also mentioned on the slide, meaning that we do, as many other investors in this field do, we, we ex exclude certain activities or topics or industries from an ESG point of view, but we also have the ability to engage on ESG topics. And this is uh, kind of going back to what we do our, or the approach that we have decided to take. You know? So we have decided to engage on ESG with all the investors that we have because of our ability to access companies, as I mentioned before, no, because we do the diligence directly, we therefore strike data ourselves. And also because we, we see this as a critical risk mitigation factor and also an opportunity to further strengthen our impact narrative. Now, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, Veronica, that one, one of the trends that are that you see and that we actually also see in, in 2020 is, is the <clears throat> increasing shift from investors from risk mitigation to um, what was the word that you use? Uh, to value creation. engagement, value creation. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. Yes. And I, I totally support that. No, and 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 I, I just I just want to quote something that uh, uh, Frank mentioned earlier. He said. Um, we, we see, correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, uh, that climate change is a key topic for most investors, for almost all investors today. You know? and, and I believe that the, the, when you look at um, value creation, a lot of people today who talk about ESG are more or less consistently talking about climate change and climate related issues only. You know? And again, we're moving from risk mitigation to value creation. But the reality is also that one of the challenges that we see, or that I see personally, is the lack of consistency in terms of the broader ESG uh, uh, issues. No, I think um, Andrew made a comment before, and I found that very interesting, that it was hard for him to, I think you said something like, it was hard for you to understand why ESG was so prominent uh, in, in, the, in, in the narrative and in the, in, the, in the conversations of investors today and not before, because to you it was clear that uh, these all these topics that are covered under ESG have always been relevant. No, but And the reality is that, look, I, I don't have, decades of experience in this sector. I come from, uh, my background is more on ESG management in companies like the ones in which we all invest. So the reality is that when I joined this sector, I was a little bit shocked by the lack of understanding that uh, we, we we all had on these topics and the, the reality of these topics, the importance of these topics, say, uh, until let's say maybe two, three, five years ago. No, and I'm talking about the broader financial community. No? And, and, and this is also something that you, might also see as, as something that is evolving and changing and dramatically in the past two or three years that it's going to shape the discussion in 2020 dramatically. Um, so to me, the, the problem is that um, on, on climate change, as Frank mentioned earlier, yes, there, there is some sort of uh, common approach and people are more comfortably talking about not only risk mitigation, but value creation, because there's a standardization behind it. Now, keep in mind that if you talk about climate change, we typically, all of us, uh, clients and investors talk about the same type of methodology to measure and validate data. But this doesn't really uh, 
um, this is not the case for the, the other ESG uh, factors. No, so the, the lack of a standardization on, on ESG issues is something that I I, I think it's going to be a big topic in 2020. No, and, and you mentioned earlier the the report that was recently published at the World Economic Forum, Veronica, and and I believe this is mm -hmm. one of the good steps in the right direction. No, I, I strongly believe that we need to all urgently push for more standardization on ESG information, okay? Because there's on one hand data that is being directly reported by companies, not typically corporates, but also other types of companies that report data through questionnaires. And then there's the other the other hand, well, on the other hand, the, the type of due diligence that we do that allows us to extract data directly. The reality is that there's no standardization. You cannot compare data that we extract to, for example, the data that Andrew or Frank are extracting. No? Because in the end, all of us, if you read our approach to ESG, we all say that we have our own internal uh, criteria for you know, defining what is material and what is not, for defining what topics we look at and what topics we don't look at. Okay, And I think this is kind of the, the issue, no? that on one hand, we are all in the end using different frameworks, different surveys, different ratings, different benchmarks. And that's very complicated to 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 then let's say in order to, to for all of us as an industry to create a compelling narrative. Yes, one some of us maybe have you know found the actual relevant materials and have the ability not only to measure them properly and to make sure that the data is reliable, because this is something really important to highlight, but also that you know that we have able to understand and analyze the correlation between ESG factors and other let's say financial factors. No, but the reality is that if data is not standardized, we can all replicate the same type of assessments. And until then, we will not be able to go public showing, look, these are the results. No? And furthermore, the lack of a standardization to me means that the, the accounting rules behind the data that we are using, it's, it might not even be good to start with. Why? Because companies might just simply be reporting based on their own understanding. You know, let me give you a quick example, and, and with this, I'll finish my intervention. So, if we talk water, for example, no, I think Andrew mentioned water as, as one environmental topic that it's worth looking at. No, if, if we if we think about water, we all probably think that this is a very simple topic to look at. But the reality with water is, if you think about it more broadly, and this I can share with you, you know, in in, in the cases where we invest, water is largely free for many companies today. No, I'm not talking about industrial companies. I'm talking about other companies. No, keep in mind that fresh water withdrawals, for example, in industries or in activities like agriculture, where we have a nice footprint. Uh, accounts for between 50 70 percent of the total with uh, withdrawals worldwide no talking about freshwater withdrawals depending on the sources that you look at 50 to 70. a lot of this water that uh, farmers use in their activity it's free so therefore they don't have a need to really account for that water in a say in a in a in an accurate manner okay and, and it's not only you know the the you know the reality that that we see in these cases, and and then again this is water that that flows from the smallholder farmers to the larger corporates that buys this product, transform the products, and puts them in the market. No, and who is who is struggling to 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 report water footprint? Let's say for example, as, or water risk associated to its supply chain. No? So we 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 work directly with the, the supply chain, and we see the lack of consistent accounting rules no and and it's not only the fact that you, you don't pay for water therefore you don't have a meter and you need to kind of estimate the water consumption it's also the fact that you might be using to to, uh, to let's say to estimate the same water volume you might be using your own methodology which is probably radically different to the methodology that i will use so there is on one hand lack of uh, accounting rules standardized accounting rules for measuring data and there's a lack of uh, standardized let's say accounting rules for for us as asset managers or as say investors if you like to validate this data no? so i think this is something that certainly uh, will be a topic for discussion in 2020 and with Terrific. this I'm thank, done. thank you so much <laughs> thank you so much pedro um definitely want to take some of the questions from the audience uh, one has been submitted to us uh, via the, the chat, which I think is a, a really interesting one. And maybe Andrew and um, Frank will, will tee this your way. So, so the, the audience member asks, you know, that in published descriptions of ESG, 
uh, it's, it's often generally highlights how the is issues are raised, but there's a great deal of opacity around how that information is actually being factored into investment analysis. Um, so could you just perhaps maybe by, by use of an example or either of a specific transaction fund or what have you, security, just shed some light into exactly how are leading investors incorporating this data meaningfully into investment decisions? Maybe start with you, Andrew. Okay. Um, no, I think it's a, it's a very good question because I, I think part of the challenge that the industry has, I think we can sometimes trip over ourselves in our desire to talk about the why. I think we've fairly, fairly well established why action around climate, diversity, et cetera, is a good thing. Uh, it's sometimes harder to distill that down into into the how, how and the what, which is why I very much emphasize that my, my view of ESG is around about it's a series of inputs into better understanding the capital allocation and the behavior and performance of a business. You know, I, I think as Pedro just highlighted, this is a really very complex subject and it always has to be put into the con into context, into the context of the business, the industry, the company, uh, uh, and the objectives. Which is why I think sometimes that sort of labelling approach is where it's methodology over purpose is is very appealing because it's relatively straightforward, but it's actually not part and parcel of the um, of the re really what you're trying to do as an active manager. And I, and I do think that. Active management is particularly well suited to um, to sustainability considerations. I think you know maybe a good way of thinking about it. And one of the challenges is when we think about the energy transition, and when we come to valuing um, you know, uh, fossil fuel assets or companies in, in in transition. You know, I think very much for me, it's about trying to understand where companies have incentives to allocate capital that will be rewarded over time or where there might be institutional barriers to a transition. You know, so for some of the super major oil companies, frankly, it's going to be very hard to transition to being fully renewable because of the scale of their business, particularly while oil and gas demand is growing. Now, that might seem superficially, it makes them an attractive investment, but if regulation is growing, if the, the rate of change of demand is diminishing, if um, the, the threat of uh, carbon, or the, the, not threat, the opportunity, I mean, not which way you view it, but the opportunity of carbon pricing is there, that could pr you know, provide a sort of uh, an inability for their corporate returns to regress to a more normalized level. And I think that trying to factor in those different scenarios is an important element of, uh, of what we do. I think it's also equally important that you should always recognize that even if you're investing in a green technology, being green is not a sufficient condition to make a very good investment decision. You know, you do have to think about how these things relate to the business model how the, the uh, competitor analysis, the opportunity set, you know, example, man solar panel manufacturing has been very important as the unit cost of electricity produced tumbled uh, uh, over the last 20 years. So it's been very difficult in a manufacturing company to make money. You have to think of where in the value chain uh, the value accrues. And that's, that's true in sort of non-ESG issues. So I think it is about making sure that you really integrate it into your financial assessment and it will vary from industry to industry uh, and whether it's about a growth opportunity or trying to avoid a business model that becomes marooned by changing demand. Terrific. I'd love to open it up for other questions uh, for those uh, who've been listening in. Um, you can send in your questions via chat. In the meantime, uh, panelists, I have a few other questions here that have been sent. Um, a number of uh, participants have asked about questions around greenwashing, and they've raised it at two levels. Level one is, you know, how do you as, an, as investors really detect 
the extent to which either the uh, assets or the companies uh, that you hold are uh, truly reporting out their ESG performance correctly. And then secondly, at the next level up is for your own products and offerings and what you see in the broader industry, um, where I think there have been unfortunately some examples uh, in the broader market of so-called sustainability products that <clears throat> have had questionable uh, issuers included in them. So if you could comment um, on you know, both when you are yourself are making these sorts of decisions, but also as you look at the broader industry, how can we really address this question of greenwashing? Maybe Frank, if you wanted to, to start. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> and, well, I think greenwashing suggests that we uh, focus on, on the climate bit, but I, I guess uh, what we found out is that uh, transparency, uh, We <clears throat> when we launch a fund, it has a certain mandate, certain strategy, and we have a whole lot of legal wording in what we do and what we won't do. Um, but uh, then it, it, it's really about uh, being transparent on what type of assets do you buy and based on what ESG considerations do you decide to invest or not. Um, I think there, there's clearly, uh, if you invest in a, a wind farm or solar park, you can say if it's a secondary deal, so uh, an existing asset, you, you don't add capacity, you don't add uh, renewable energy to the system. So that that's a question. In, in, uh, do we uh, um, contribute in the tent or we only change asset hands? Uh, and the second bit is, if you invest in, for example, uh, diesel locomotives, that has a uh, a lot of pros and cons. And I give that example because we often have to debate. Uh, if, you, if you invest in real, there's a lot of arguments that say that it's cleaner than road transportation, but then still uh, having diesel-powered locomotives is obviously uh, less environment-friendly uh, than electric or hydrogen probably in, in the near future. So I think for us, it, it's not so much about pretending that we are uh, uh, offering a, a clean portfolio, but we are offering a very transparent uh, investment portfolio where we can explain why we did certain investments and, and also acknowledge that for a large number of infrastructure assets, uh, it, it's a, a, a great picture with uh, pluses and minuses. Um, so I think greenwashing is, is definitely a risk because there's a lot of pressure from the investment community to well, provide clean solutions. Uh, but we are very cautious not to, uh, let's say, claim benefits that we are not uh, realizing. Great. We have a, another group of questions pertaining to ESG ratings. Uh, so there's one question around, does the panel see uh, 2020 as being a year where we will start to see some convergence across SASB and GRI? Um, and will you know what implications might that have for the broader space? So, would anyone like to offer their perspectives on the broader ESG rating landscape and what your outlook is for 2020 on it? Uh, hi, Sandra here. I, I think for the, the two two ways of looking at the ratings is the GRI and the SASB ones, and I do think we are beginning to get greater dialogue and. Uh, and sharing on the actual reporting of what companies are doing. I think, you know, a number of speakers have said that if we can move to a greater standardization of corporate reporting, that makes everybody's life a lot easier. I think it makes the corporate's life easier because instead of having to fill in 30 different surveys on Excel that are inconsistent uh, across different uh, data pro uh, uh, providers, they can maybe consolidate it down into a standardized set of metrics that people can look at. But you know, coming back to the using the language as SASB, that are material to, to that company and that industry. So and I'm I'm pleased to see that you know the big four accounting firms are now really actively involved in this debate and working with SASB and others uh, because I was you know, say it is really need to focus it on from the corporate perspective that people really doing it day to day. Um, I think we need to just be a bit careful with not getting too much of a desire to label everything and ESG rating at, ratings at the fund level. It's fine for third party providers to, to rate whether we do what we say we do across 
all the different industries. We just want to be careful that we don't end up with there being one dominant way of viewing what ESG looks like, what good is. Because then you have the danger that everybody plays the methodology over purpose. You know, because if you give people a methodology and it's the methodology that's going to determine whether you look good and determine your flows, there's inevitably going to be a behavioral finance uh, reaction of trying to game the system to be the greenest or the most you know, sustainable thing out there. And I do worry a little bit about that, that we, we will just get an ESG herding effect. And we see it in public markets already that there is some talk of a nifty 50 of sustainability for those companies that are viewed as the most sustainable or in most people's portfolios and trading now at very rich premiums over where they were maybe two or three years ago, both relative to their own history and the market. So we do need to have remember that market have an important role in terms of price discovery and business model discovery. It can't be made prescriptive. It can't be made about a methodology that predetermines because the big variable in the market that none of us control is, is pricing of the securities. You know, your sustainability criteria probably uh, change very slowly, but the valuation of your stock can move dramatically and you know that's why valuation and values are two very different things. Terrific. We have just one minute left on the call, so I'd love to just ask for a quick lightning round across all three panelists. But if you know you had one overall imperative for the industry as a whole to work towards in 2020 to really advance uh, sustainable investing and really taking this mainstream, what's what's one critical thing that you would say that the industry really needs to focus on? Uh, maybe Pedro, start with you. Well, as I mentioned earlier, to me, key it's uh, you know to tackle, to, to push for a standardization on ESG information that all companies will use in their disclosure to investors and stakeholders, and also to start working towards a validation of the, the, this data to make sure that data it's it's reliable and that we as investors can make informed decisions based on this data. Super. Frank? I think it's uh, speed. Uh, I think things are going so quickly now uh, that we're uh, the, the biggest risk is to be uh, lagging uh, and, and not be shy of uh, taking, taking very strong positions uh, because that's what the investment community expects. Uh, and in turn, I, I think we should also put back the question of the investment community um, and they obviously have their financial return requirements uh, but asking the questions and I think there are a few examples of yeah, if indeed you're raising your money from a pension fund they have their fiduciary duty towards the uh, people need to pay the pensions but all the individuals behind uh, maybe also try to access their uh, them and, and ask them if you really think uh, sustainability is important um, uh, they get the get the full mandate uh, and not um, stay in the middle where it's uh, too much about small steps, but potentially be able to make bigger steps. Perfect. And Andrew, cl closing words. Yeah, just qu quickly, I would say it, it's it's building on the whole notion of active ownership and being engaged owners to. Uh, provide the, the the necessary accountability if companies are going to start to talk much more about corporate purpose who is it that's calling them to account uh, on those claims and I think that has to be where active engaged ownership uh, that goes well beyond proxy voting is an essential part of keeping it real and driving that system change effectively that Frank just mentioned. Terrific well those are three strong rallying cries and very consistent with how we see things. To everyone who uh, stayed with us for this full hour, thank you so much for joining. This is a fascinating topic and one that uh, we're so delighted that Reuters is now focused on and will be doing subsequent work on. Um, and thank you very much to Reuters for convening us all today. Thank you, Veronica. Um, yes, just to just to add up and, and to wrap up, we've had a an inundated with numerous questions throughout the webinar, um, and I know we haven't got to all of them, 
So what I'll do is I'll collect these all together and I'll send them out to our panelists and we should be able to distribute some of the answers to those along with the recordings in the next week or so. Um, also, if we are going to be running a number of other um, pieces of content around this um, ESG topic and taking it mainstream and, and moving it forward in the industry um, for investors. So we will, oh, we're looking for ideas. If anyone's got anything specific that they're looking to, to find, to tackle, that they really want to know, then by all means, drop me a note on email. You'll have my email when I send across the recordings to the webinar. So please feel free to reply to me. Um, likewise, if you're interested to come to the ESG Investment Europe Summit, um, we'll be more than happy to talk you through um, what's going on in May this, um, well, on the 27th and the 28th here in London. Um, we'll be launching that conference early next week, so please keep an eye out for that. But yeah, just to thank Veronica and to thank our panelists, Pedro, Frank and Andrew, um, for a great webinar. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.